Welcome to your weekly UAS news update. This is the week of June 7th, 2021. This week we've got four topics. The first one is kind of an interesting one. There was a Matrice 300 RTK accident and uh, we found the uh, NTSB report, uh, the preliminary report, I should say, and we'll talk about what happened, kind of a freak accident. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, hotel and the Evo 2 and the smart controller. There is a chip shortage and, uh, and they have to make some some tough decisions. We'll talk about the Mav the DJI Mini SE, which showed up, uh, special edition maybe. We'll, we'll talk about the drone in itself, kind of a, a weird combination of things going on with this drone. And then lastly, we'll give you an update on the FAA Symposium, which is going on uh, today. We're recording on Wednesday and tomorrow. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what I heard uh, during today's session and uh, let's get started. <music> The first thing this week is kind of a, a, a freak accident and, and I wanted to talk about it because I think there is a lot of um, airmanship involved, if I can say, or, or, or decision making. You know, for those of you that are in the course, in my Part 107 course, uh, you understand uh, all of this. For those of you that are Part 107, you should understand decision making. And I think there was a lack of decision making in this case, which uh, could have been even more dramatic than what happened. So let me kind of backtrack. This happened on May 6th. There is a Matrice, DJI Matrice 300, that was involved in an accident that actually resulted in serious injury to the remote pilot in command. Uh, this happened in a, an area that was close to a DJI Geo zone, a restricted zone. The remote pilot said that he was unaware of the restricted area and took off. The airplane was, the aircraft was flying and lost the controller function of the aircraft. He was unable to basically control the aircraft other than going up and down, apparently. He hit RTH, returned to home, and the aircraft started to come back, but um, hovered over the ground uh, and became unresponsive. At that point, the remote pilot command decided to grab onto the aircraft and attempted to move it physically by grabbing, I guess, onto the, uh, the, the, the landing gear and moving it out of the way and was unable to do so. Uh, it looks like I don't think they could land at the moment because of maybe obstacles underneath it, I'm not sure. And then, the, uh, the remote pilot in command decided to hand off the controller to somebody who was there. It looks like they were doing a demo for, I think, a police department maybe. And uh, so they handed to, the, to, to a bystander that was watching the demo. And then they attempted to hold the drone while the bystander was trying to shut down the motors. Um, if you know anything about DJI drones, the, the shutdown, the emergency shutdown actually has to be set up uh, ahead of time. My guess, it doesn't say in the report, but my guess is that that wasn't actually set up, so they weren't able to shut down the motors in flight. So at that point, the remote pilot decided to actually reach through to the battery in order to pull the battery and shut down the aircraft. The problem is the Matrice 300, the way that it's designed, the propellers are actually, uh, the motors are actually facing down instead of being on top. So uh, in order to get to the battery, you have to go through the propellers. Uh, propellers were obviously rotating, hit the remote pilot uh, arm. Apparently there was tendon and nerve damage. And, and the interesting part of the whole thing, I think is really interesting, is the remote pilot command actually uh, continued to hold the aircraft until the battery uh, exhausted and then the, the drone basically came down. Uh, Again, I, I, I'm actually at a loss for word about what happened there. Uh, the, the the lack of judgment, I would say. Now, this is easy to say. You know, this is uh, armchair quarterbacking here, but. Um, you have to think about these situations because this is obviously a series of decisions that led to this accident. But you have to think about, you know, the, the, the danger of losing a drone versus uh, seriously injuring someone, possibly even people around you uh, when you make these decisions. So um, I think there's a lot of questions. I'm going to wait until the final report comes out and I'm actually going to do, I think, a full uh, video on just this specific accident because I think there's a lot to learn in here. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, in aviation, we have a tendency to, in man aviation at least, to look at accidents, whether they led to uh, the death of someone or, or a serious injury, but we always, and it sounds like a little uh, dark sometimes, 
but it always leads to a teaching moment. And I think this is something that we need to do in the UAS industry as well, so we can all learn from somebody else's mistake. Uh, no judgment, quite frankly. Um, you know, the, the, it's always hard to, to say what happened, what went on in their head when they made these decisions, but the more people are aware of what happened, the more this is something that we can practice and hopefully avoid uh, in the future. All right. I'll stop with this story. Let's move to the next one. And the next one is about Hotel. Hotel is having a shortage of computer chip just like any other manufacturer of any electronics in the world at the moment. And, uh, and there's a memo that was leaked. It looked like I tried to find the origin of the memo, but uh, I couldn't find it officially on the Hotel website. But it looks like it was actually, I don't know if it was leaked, but it was given to the, uh, the network of uh, resellers for Hotel. And what they explained in the memo, the new CEO actually explains in the memo, is that they're having a hard time finding chips for the Hotel Evo 2. So they made the decision to actually create a new version of the Evo 2, the Evo 2 V2, if you want to call it that. And, um, and as a result, unfortunately, because it's a new chip, the smart controller that we've been talking about that they're about to release, there's also going to be two versions of it. There's going to be a smart controller version 1, which is going to be only compatible with the Evo 2 version 1. So older version works with the older version of the smart controller. But because there's a new chip, the new version of the Evo 2 will not be compatible with the old version of the smart controller. Not so old because it just came out, but they're preparing to do a second version of the smart controller. Evo 2 version 1 will have a smart controller version 1. Evo 2 version 2 will have a smart controller version 2 with two different chips, which, which means that there is no cross compatibility whatsoever. So if you're about to buy a smart controller, make sure that you are getting the right one for the right drone that you're going to get. And uh, just remember that, well, it's going to be very limited functionality if you know you have to sell it or whatever it is. So. Um, I think it, it's it's obviously it, it's been hurting a lot of different companies. Even Apple actually uh, is having to delay a lot of their products because they, they just can't find the chips. So uh, the batteries will remain the same. They'll be compatible across the Evo 2 V1 and V2. Uh, we are going to be talking to the new uh, CEO of Hotel. Uh, so it's going to be on Friday. So two days from the day that I'm releasing. So the day that this video goes live, we're actually going to be interviewing the new uh, the new CEO of Hotel. So actually, I'm, I'll be bringing this topic up and then we'll be talking about it. We'll be interviewing him for the Pixel Drone Show. So that's going to be released the following Tuesday. So if you have questions, actually, um, I might get them on time. So leave them in the comments on Friday when you see this video, if you have questions for uh, the new CEO, and then I'll, I'll be sure to try to ask them. Uh, next thing, let's talk about some more drones. Now, a little bit smaller drone here. We're talking about the Mini. Now, if you know anything about the Mini, the DJI Mini, there's a Mini Original and then there's a Mini 2. And then now there's a Mini SE that just showed up. Uh, people posted pictures on different forums and they found them at Walmart. There's no announcement. There is no information available on the DJI website. What it looks like from the specs that we found on the Walmart website is that um, it has the same specs as the original Mini uh, with the non 4K camera. I think it's a 2.7K camera. And then, uh, but the difference is that it comes with the Mini 2 controller, which is the same, I'm, I'm reaching here to uh, my little shelf, which is the same as what we've seen for the Air 2, the Air 2S and the Mini 2. Uh, they all come with this uh, standard controller right here. Uh, hard to find any information on this thing, but because of this controller, I can only guess, and this is speculation, that the Mini SE would actually have the um, the OcuSync 2.0 technology as opposed to the original Mini, which has Wi-Fi, which was a big critique from people that used it. Basically, uh, you can't fly this thing very far because it loses signal very quickly. Now, if this is the case, if it is actually the Mini equipped with this thing, uh, I don't remember the price point for it. There was no price actually listed, but uh, if it's pretty cheap, this would be a pretty cool entry-level drone uh, with OcuSync 2.0 without the, uh, the original Wi-Fi controller. We'll find out more, hopefully. If you have more information, if you know more than we did, uh, just let us know in the comment, but this is what we found so far. Okay, last thing this week is the FA Symposium uh, going on today, which is Wednesday and Thursday uh, tomorrow. 
lots of good discussions today. I spent the entire day listening to people uh, presenting myself. I was actually presenting on a panel about uh, night operation. Uh, went really well. Uh, presenting with Victoria Gallagher from uh, the FAA, who's in charge of the Lance program. So uh, very insightful discussions afterwards, after the session that we had. Um, lots of discussions about the new roles in general, remote ID operations over people. Administrator Dixon actually talked a few about a few things uh, early this afternoon. The first one was the formation of a new aviation ruling committee. It's called an ARC. If you're not familiar with the ARC, the FAA uh, puts together these, these teams of uh, people from the industry and then they ask them a bunch of questions and they ask them to work on these questions and then report to the FAA. It's sort of a guidance, okay? Uh, the FAA is going to put new regulation in place, so they're looking for guidance from the industry. And uh, in the past, it's worked fairly well, I would say. Um, if you remember the NPRM for remote ID, there were actually a lot of uh, proposed rules that came from the Aviation Ruling Committee. They also ignored a lot of what the Aviation Ruling Committee had mentioned in some of their meetings. So it's not always 100%. They don't always follow it 100%. But anyway, I digress. The ARC, the Aviation Ruling Committee that they're developing now is going to be uh, to create regulation for routine vi uh, beyond visual line of sight flights. This is all in place and all on time with the, the, the plan from the FAA. If you look at the last four or five years of planning from the FAA and the next five to 10 years of planning, um, they wanted to put in place remote ID, which is what they've worked on. The next step with remote ID is to make complex operations such as beyond visual line of sight, more of a routine operation. So this is the next step. They're moving along in their uh, the stages that they had set for a while. And so uh, the, the committee is gonna have six months to report back to the FA on what they're recommending the FAA does in order to create beyond visual line of sight flights that are more routine and not so complex. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of it. I'll, I'll definitely be reporting on that uh, in the future. Another discussion from uh, Administrator Dixon, he talked about AAM, Advanced Air Mobility, uh, this is a topic that I don't talk very often about. I talk about it sometimes on the on the airplane news update that uh, I mentioned because, well, it's a slightly different world than the UAS world, but it's a, definitely a big upcoming world and a, a big upcoming industry. So advanced air mobility, if you're not familiar, uh, air taxi using large drones that are going to carry passengers. Think about the Uber in the sky, okay? You, you're going to have these drones that are going to be able to carry two, three, four, maybe more passengers uh, to different locations, and these will be either uh, controlled by someone on the ground or eventually autonomous. But anyway, the FAA talks about this because this is kind of the new set of regulation that they're working on, even though Administrator Dixon mentioned that there's no new regulation in the short term that they are expecting for AAM. There's a current framework of regulation that they're going to keep and that they're going to work with because he said, well, there's no real need for uh, additional regulation at this stage. So. Uh, this is a topic that I'm actually really interested in. So um, I have a, a big document right now, which is a concept of operation document that I have to read that's uh, been in my inbox uh, that just came out that a friend of mine sent. And, um, and I'll keep you guys posted if I find any uh, good information in there. Okay. Another thing that Administrator Dixon mentioned was the trust exam, which is the recreational exam that we've uh, been talking about for a while because the FA has been promising it for a while, uh, a while being several years now. Uh, they are in the final stages of selecting testing providers, uh, which is what uh, Dixon mentioned. And then there's gonna be more announcement expected soon. Uh, tomorrow is, uh, there, there's a panel tomorrow on trust. So I don't know if they're gonna announce more information tomorrow, uh, but if they do, we'll find out, we'll let you know. Um, and then the uh, some other nuggets that I caught through discussions during the meeting, during the, the symposium, uh, September will be the end of the lens authorization process at night as we know it. And this is a new process I've mentioned before. If you want to fly at night, you have to submit a lens request during the day, carry this PDF with you, and then you can fly at night uh, for that specific day. Well, this is going away uh, in September. And what we've been told, actually, um, Victoria Gallagher,
Gallagher from the FA mentioned that uh, the process will now be available in Lance. So if you have a, a loft, for example, formerly known as Kitty Hawk, and, uh, and you want to submit a Lance request at night, then you'll be able to do it. Uh, it's, a, it's a software limitation issue at the moment, and uh, that's the reason why we have to go through these hoops, but uh, hopefully we'll, they'll be able to make it work by September. Um, something else that I found uh, was a community-based organization. Uh, this... Uh, if you've been following the recreational flying, the, the regulation around recreational flying, 44809, uh, there is two more things that need to be put in place by the FAA uh, since the Reauthorization Act of 2018. One of them is the trust exam, which looks like is right around the corner. And then the last one is going to be selecting community-based organizations. Now you're going to say, don't we have community-based organizations at the moment? Uh, we don't. The uh, AMA, for example, or, or Flight Test or the FPV Freedom Coalition, they're not really considered CBOs, community-based organizations. They, they are considered um, uh, aeromodeling communities, I guess, if you want to call them that. Uh, the FA is looking to standardize the process and to basically select community-based organizations that are going to have guidelines which you will need to follow. So you'll need in the future to pick a CBO. You don't have to pay for it. You'll just have to say, hey, this is the guidelines that I'm following. Um, and, uh, and, and this process is taking a while. The FA has not selected anyone at the moment. Uh, they are coming up with an advisory circular first that is going to explain how somebody can become a CBO. Uh, so Pilot Institute, if we wanted to become a CBO, which we don't, uh, then we would have to follow the regulation or the, the guideline in the advisory circular. Um, that advisory circular is kind of the key to everything. It's right around the corner as per the FA. Uh, could mean a month or 10 months, whatever. Uh, but... Uh, the, there's a common period first. So we'll see uh, a bunch of proposed uh, advisory circular, I guess, going into the federal register and then asking people to comment probably for 30 to 60 days. And then after that, the FA will review the comments and then issue the advisory circular. So we're, we're, we're not, it's, it's around the corner, but it's, it's still a few months away. Um, and then the last thing, the last piece of uh, information that I get from the symposium is a new version of the UAS study guide for part 107 is in the making. Uh, it's been delayed and they had to kind of rewrite a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but one once we get that, it will replace the current study guide and be more like the, the pilot handbook of aeronautical knowledge for UAS. So I'm actually excited about this document because I think it's going to be a great teaching aid and, and teaching tool and learning tool for all of you that are working on your part 107. Okay, Whew. this was a long, <laughs> long news update for uh, drones this week. Check out the airplane news updates that we have. We talk about a guy trying to get into the cockpit of a Delta flight. Uh, there was a Frontier A320 that uh, overshot a runway. Uh, United is buying some pretty fast supersonic jets. And then a uh, American airline that rejected takeoff after hitting a bunch of birds. And there's a video actually showing all of that. So, um, so head over to the airplane channel if you want more information on that. And um, as always, like, subscribe, comment, do everything you do. And I will see you guys next week for hopefully some more news in the UAS world. All right, fly safe.